I want to talk a little bit about ownership structure and mainly how it relates to the life cycle of your brokerage. So at some point, every company reaches an intersection or a crossroads, or maybe if you're a mathematician out there, an inflection point of their life cycle within their business. All right, if you're in business long enough, these events become so natural or commonplace that maybe you missed the switch over from the different life cycles. So when it comes to the growth of a company, there are a lot of people that seem like they're immobilized or paralyzed to making decisions. And matter of fact, they call this the analysis of paralysis or paralysis of analysis. Misspoke, sorry. It's one of those, I know. <laughs> I knew I was wrong the minute she started looking at me like that. Um, so what we're going to mainly talk about now are the three phases of a business life cycle. These phases, you can actually function within one of these three phases, or you can go in and out of these phases uh, many different times throughout the life of your business. Now, on the screen, you will notice that there are four. Uh, we are not going to talk about the startup phase we have covered this, like I said once before, in uh, we've got a class called Starting a Real Estate Brokerage. That covers the startup phase. So the assumption in the rest of this class is that you are already up and running and that you are thinking about your company. And as it currently is existing, there are three typical phases that a business will be in. Now, you don't... You, you can choose these phases, and what I mean is you can migrate and do activities within your brokerage that will put you in this phase, but you've got to be in one of these three. There's no opting out, so to speak. They are what we call the status quo phase. There is a growth phase, and then there is the exit phase. All three of these are common and you can switch back and forth. So let's talk a little bit about it. The status quo phase, or sometimes it's called the do nothing phase. And there are plenty of people out there that love the stability of the status quo phase. There's no problem with it. I've talked to a lot of brokers, managing brokers that is, that love being they're only person. It's only me. I do all the stuff. I don't answer to anybody. I collect all the paychecks. It's just me. And that's how I want it. That is the status quo phase. There are plenty of people out there that enjoy this business and they make a good living and they don't have any, I don't want to say aspirations because that always sounds like everybody has to do it. They don't have any desire to get any bigger. The problem with the status quo phase is that it's typically the most dangerous phase there is. Because what happens is when you get into the status quo phase and you're doing nothing and there are people within your company. Now, status quo doesn't mean you have to be one. It might mean that your status, you enjoy being four or five people. So don't get that wrong. And so don't confuse that with the next, what I'm about to say, because you could have four or five people in your company and you love this size. You don't want to get any bigger. However, one of the other people inside of this company does not gel well with that status quo. They want to try and get bigger. They want the company to be bigger. They want to see uh, more size, more technology growth, things of that nature. That could cause an internal friction 
between you as the managing broker and say this person who's always coming to you going, hey, dude, there's this new technology called blah, 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 blah. I think we should look at it. It could help us get bigger. Well, maybe you don't want to get bigger. So that is the one problem with status quo is that it is, in fact, do nothing. You know, you're happy where you're at. So there is a huge difference between your business doing okay and your business trying to sustain or create some growth. So I want to give you some signs and you guys can feel free to mark these down. This isn't a quiz. Feel free to mark these down and see if this fits you. Typically, people that are in the status quo phase are slow to respond to new trends. You know, hey, if it ain't broke, why fix it? They don't want to adopt. Uh, I remember for a long time, and I'm not saying it's 100% right now, but uh, all the showing companies that now handle showings, when those first started, there are a lot of people that resisted the use of showing time, centralized showing solution, broker bay, all of those because they didn't want to learn a new technology. They didn't want to ramp up. Hey, I'm resistant to that. Um, sometimes if you're missing, missing your target numbers uh, or sales numbers, uh, missing your targeted sales numbers. <laughs> I'll get it correct here in a minute. If you feel that costs outweigh the revenue, this is typically one mindset that traditionally I have seen actually is in the exit phase. When people are like, well, I could do this, but I don't want to get any bigger. I'm thinking about quitting. When we went way back in 2014, when we used to here in Indiana, we had salespersons and brokers and everybody had to go through that transition from a salesperson to a broker. I remember dozens of people that actually exited the business simply because the cost outweighed the benefit to them. All right, now, not judging, and don't you judge because everybody has their own uh, set of parameters they work by but they felt at that point that the cost outweighed the revenue and actually left the business. If you're working really, really hard at standing still, that's usually a sign. You know, you're doing busy work, shuffling paper, moving the paper from this side of your desk to this side of your desk, and you're not really producing uh, quantifiable or measurable or the easy way to look at producing money. A lot of times that's status quo. You know, hey, I'm happy doing two deals a month. I'm good. And therefore, but I go to work 40 hours a week because I talk to this person and do that, yada, yada, yada. And the last one, obviously, is if your enthusiasm is starting to drop off for the profession. I currently have at least one agent that every time he gets a deal, he tells me how much he hates real estate. So his enthusiasm is certainly dropping off. So that's the status quo phase, the do nothing. Now, the next phase is the growth phase. And this is the one that people slide into the growth phase, sometime unbeknowingly to themselves. And if you are not aware of this, it could actually limit, stifle, or actually stop the growth. All right? So there are an increasing amount of ways that you can enter the growth phase and be successful, you just gotta understand that. So there are typically four types of ways or four types of growth vehicles that your company can use to start growing your company. The most common one that we see is through growth in recruiting. Now, there are a lot of people that think they're in the status quo phase when they first start. Oh, it's just me. I enjoy it, but I'm going to get my buddy to come work for me. Dude, you just slipped into the growth phase because growth through, acquis or growth through recruiting 
is one of the major ways that your company now go is, goes into growth. And when growth happens, there are issues that have to be thought of. Once again, I go back to the example I used earlier in the course, and I don't want to beat the dead horse. You can't go from just you, one agent, to 100 agents overnight without having some technology pains, without having some payroll pains, without having marketing pains. So you have got to understand that if I'm in the growth phase and recruiting, there are other issues I have to think about other than just bringing on a new person. I get a lot of small companies call me all the time and, hey, it's just me and I want to recruit my for, first agent. Do you have an a independent contractor agreement I, we, I can look at or use or talk to you about? And then I ask them a couple of questions. Okay, how are you going to pay them? Is it direct deposit? You're going to write checks? Do you even have a bank account with that uh, company name on it? Uh, how are you going to track the earnest money? Do you have a CRM for clients? What about your marketing for the company on top of just your marketing? So there are some other questions that have to be answered in your growth phase. Growth through acquisition, very common. Buy another franchise, or I'm sorry, I misspoke. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. Buy another brokerage. You know, you could absorb or buy another brokerage so that all of a sudden now you do make that leap from two or three of you to 18 of you. You bought another small brokerage that's going to help you in, during that growth phase. Very similar to that is growth through merger. You know, maybe you with your two or three merge with another guy that's two or three, and now you've merged into a new company. And one of you's got to be the managing broker, but now you've got all the technology growth. You've got all of the marketing and HR and all that stuff that you have to think about. And then mirth, uh, growth through expansion. This literally just means you're opening a second office. Now you've got communication issues with that other office, especially if that other office, God forbid, is going to be out of state. So these are your growth uh, strategies that will help you slide into the growth phase. Just remember, you can be in that growth phase, but not necessarily know it. So make sure you understand where you're at. So here's the, the pages. I forgot to flip the slides up there. Um, growth through recruiting is probably the number one way that uh, brokerages use to grow. Um, however, it's not the only way. There are a whole bunch of other issues. Growth through acquisition, uh, uh, M&A, that's the mergers that we talked about. Mergers is very similar to acquisition and usually they get lumped in together called M&A mergers and acquisitions. Um, the only difference is when you merge, you have to understand that you will could bring technology with you or you could bring competing technology with you. Um, that's usually one of the big things. You know, you're in your company and let's say you use XYZ showing company and you're going to acquire another company that would then put them under your umbrella and your new rules. If you merge with another company and they are using, you know, DEF showing uh, methodology, now what are you going to do because you have brought in another company into form this new one and you've got two technologies so you're going to have to understand how that works growth through expansion that's just your geographic footprint once again growing that geographic footprint tends to uh, make a lot of owners want to appear to be bigger um, I don't know if I said that correctly. It gives the impression that you're a bigger company. So there are a lot of companies that do this. There is a company out there that does the whole work from home and all of the agents actually open in an office. So when you look this company up, there's like 17 offices because each agent is their own office. They are structured that way. So it's blah, 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 blah. And I'm not going to give away the name. 07, 08, 
So it looks or appears as though they've got 18 or 19 offices, which could be something they're using as a marketing plan to show their clientele, hey, we've got 20 offices located throughout the state or throughout central Indiana. Um, make sure that the best way through marketing through expand, the best way to market through expansion is actually acquiring another company. Much easier to buy a existing company to expand. If we're going to open another office in the northern part of the state, I could go up and start a new company and look for a new building and sign a new lease. However, it might be quicker <clears throat> to acquire a small brokerage up in the northern part of the state that would then be more beneficial and get you to your point quicker. All right. <clears throat> now, phase number three is what we call the exit phase. There are a lot of people that aren't willing or aren't able to grow the company. This is a small point here that's really huge. There is a book called by Michael Gerber called uh, The E-Myth. E as an entrepreneurial, not, you know, e-commerce, not that E. Basically, the entire premise of the book is built around the thought that if someone's a good car mechanic, they should open a good a mechanic shop and they're going to be successful. That's not true because as you guys know, sitting here running a company is a lot more than just filling out listing agreements. And we've mentioned all of the stuff. You've got HR, you've got marketing, you know, you've got internal communication, you've got technology decision, all of these things that are part of growing a company. So there are some people that are just not able, they don't have that ability. They may be great realtors, they may sell a lot of stuff and they think I'm gonna start my own company and all of a sudden then that company starts going down the tubes because they don't know that. So the third phase is when people are like, okay, I'm ready to move out of the business or I'm ready to sell my business and move on with my life and maybe do something else. So most of us that have started brokerages have built their companies from the ground up and feel as though I don't wanna get rid of my baby, but I've gotta do something. So there are several different exit strategies that you can use. Now, most of these typically are not recommendations for real estate brokerages, <clears throat> excuse me, but they are inside of true strategies for companies. And let me give you the example. The first exit strategy that can happen is what's called an IPO, an initial public offering. This is when you take a private company public. Very few, now some of you out there, and I know you do, uh, may have aspirations of creating the next big franchise and take it public. That's possible. And I certainly don't want to deter your thought if that's what you're thinking. However, that's not the most common exit for small brokerages is to go public, but it is a viable option at least. Mergers or acquisitions, perhaps you want to be the company that gets merged into another company or you may want to get acquired by another company. Both of these, like I said, they're usually mentioned together. So we're gonna put both of them here. Maybe that is going to be how you get out of the business. You could sell your control of the business. You are the big dog head cheese top honcho, but you've got one of your agents that we mentioned just sooner Maybe they have great ideas or great aspirations to grow. And you may say, you know what, why don't you take over? I'll remain in some sort of board member or uh, advisory position and minority owner and let you take over. This is a very good clean and exit strategy usually because this uh, change in guard, so to speak, 
usually happens with somebody inside of the company who is already familiar with how the company works, your company paradigm, your company culture. So this is a very clean and exit strategy. All right. Uh, there's a thing called an aqua hire. Basically, this is just an acquisition where somebody buys your company because they want the access to your sales numbers on your 20 agents and you kind of move them over to the to the new company. So it's just an acquisition. Buyouts, very similar to what we mentioned a minute ago. You could have company buyouts where the company buys you out and takes over or perhaps a small group inside of the uh, company. Liquidation, liquidation is probably one of the most common where people just kind of quit doing business. All right. It's probably uh, the preferred exit strategy of most brokers. Hey, I want to retire and I just close the company and liquidate it and sell off the desks and the two computers and I'm done. All right. There is one other exit strategy that is on the list here. Um, and if most of you know me, you know that I love telling everybody their options. I don't try and not tell you an option because I don't like it. So I give everybody options. And there's a lot of times people look at me and go, well, that's not an option. I'm like, well, it most certainly is an option. It's not a preferred one, not one you want, but it certainly is an option. Here's an option, bankruptcy. Not a good option, but it definitely is an exit strategy. You know, declaring bankruptcy is the least desirable option, obviously. And this is a one way you just offload a non-profitable company. All right, close it down, file bankruptcy if you owe people money um, and move on with your life. Once again, it is an option. <laughs> There's few of you out there I can see that are shaking your head. Dude, I didn't write these. I'm just telling you, it's an option. Even if you notice, look up on the screen, it says the least desirable. Sure, but it most certainly is an option. So those are the three phases that your company is in. And they have to be in one of them. And you can go back and forth between them. We talked about that. You could be in status quo and be real happy. And then all of a sudden you want to decide, I'm going to try and grow the brokerage and recruit more agents. That's growth rate phase. You could then say, you know what? I'm thinking about retiring. I'm going to put my company up on the block and start soliciting for acquisition. That is the exit phase, which in theory, you could decide, hey, nobody wants to acquire it. I've got a new life. Uh, look, outlook on this. I'm going to go back in and try and grow it even bigger, slip back into the growth phase to try and grow it even bigger. So maybe you could put it up on the block, i.e. go into exit phase two or three years from now. Okay. So hold on. We're going to talk a little bit more about uh, the growth strategies and the different phases and how your corporate structure actually can affect the phase that you're in.